original pile, you place the implants. So even if there's a previously existing denture, there's going to be a gap now inside the tissue between the bone height and where the natural tissue is. And he said, don't trim it, leave it, let it heal up. But you don't want more than three millimeters of tissue existing at the time you get ready to restore it. Is that what you're saying? So if there's too much left over, you have to trim that down somehow. Right. You may, yes, you may want to correct. Okay. Usually it just peels and shrinks in the spot. And so that space there, again, day of surgery, soft lining, uh, line all into that, or co-soft, whatever you prefer. Okay. Whatever you prefer. I like line all. I'm putting line all in it right away. Okay. And that'll help get it back down where it needs to be. Then in the mandible, you need some space to clean. And again, this two millimeters is approximate, but that's what's nice to be able to get a proxy brush in there and keep it clean. And when I talk to patients about a fixed detachable or a fixed hybrid, whatever they want to call it, I tell them it's like a dock, or it's like a pier. If you pull your lip back, you're going to be able to see underneath it. Again, you want to evaluate somebody's smile. I don't know what's for every now and then you get somebody that all they show are their lower teeth. In a fall, they show their lower teeth. You sometimes then have to kind of drape this mm. so that you don't see that. But, you, but if you, when you do that, it makes it much more difficult to clean. Particularly with people that they lost their teeth for a reason. A lot of them were rapid calculus builders when they had them. Right. And so that's a, that, be, that becomes the area that's the problem. Can you put a ridge lap out anterior so there's a gap you can still get under? Um, a, a gap, um, I would rather say space, but yes. Then the other thing you can do is say, okay, the only way this is going to work is if I make a bar and then I'll make a prosthesis that snaps over the bar. Then they can take uh, it out and clean it and put it back in. So those are your options if you have aesthetic concerns of where, of, of what shows on the, on the, on the a mandibular arch. Then you need Three to five millimeters of metal framework. I like to have five. I've only ever had, um, I've only ever had, I think, one, I had one titanium bar break, but that was my problem in not picking up something on the design. And I maybe, maybe had one cast bar break. Um, and those are all repairable things. So, about five millimeters for the bar, and then you need between the, now you're saying, okay, how, do you, how come you only have two millimeters for the denture teeth? That's the two millimeters of the denture tooth that sticks out above the three millimeters of acrylic base. So this whole thing is at least five or so. And the way you design your metal framework for your bar, which you'll see later, the bar is actually back of this, that's why there's more room. But if you add this all up, you've got about 15. That's ideal. More than that is fine. Less than that, you begin to cheat and compromise. And at some point in time, you, it just doesn't, it just doesn't won't fly for you. Something's got to give. You, your teeth are too short, and you're down to the tissue, you have no room for the hygiene. And, and when you plan this out ahead of time, then, in that anterior part of the mandible, you usually, when this is a problem, you usually have plenty of bone to reduce. I mean, this isn't going to be an issue in a in a in a seventy-year-old individual that's been missing their teeth for fifteen. Years. Right, it's gone. It's just, that's not the problem. Typically, where this comes into play is somebody that's been missing their posterior dentition, and they've got six or eight anterior teeth left, and now they want them out, and they want a, some sort of implant-born prosthesis, and that's where. If you don't plan this out, you'll have a finish. Okay, then I'm going to show you. So it's 15 millimeter from CO to Paul, basically. Tell what so I can typically tell in my workup whether or not I've got enough 
that I've got enough space that I can reduce the bone, um, whether or not um, they want something fixed or they want something removable, that all comes out when you're, when you're talking to them. Right. A car. I tell them it's a car. I don't know what kind of car, but it's a car. If you're not interested in a car, then we're money. Well, I told the patient, she said, give me some kind of idea. I said, probably the cost of a car. She says, you've got to do better than that. What are you talking about? And I said, oh, $30,000, $35,000. And she looks at me and says, what the hell kind of car do you drive? <laughs> <laughs> so then I saw her drive off in the shade. <laughs> the, the important part of this from the business side of things is that you need to understand what your costs are going to be. I, 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 I go back maybe to the first, well, even, even one of these last uh, zirconium bars I did. I, I, uh, you know, I had like a four or $5,000 lab fee, and I was only figuring out maybe $2,500. You know, one of the other things is that the patients don't realize the cost of their hygiene maintenance for the, because you got to have a dentist on to take the appliance off, and then either you're scaling cleaning around the button or your high dentist then you got to put it back on and the literature is telling us we should be using new screws and put it back on and the cost of those you're going to charge the patient four four to six hundred dollars for their hygiene appointment and they're not ready for that because <laughs> often the patients who didn't come in for regular so are you still looking for all right, so I like to, I have some patients that I routinely see every six months. I have some people that come in once a year, and I have a lady that I haven't seen in 20 years. I like to see them on a routine basis. Now, in the early years, I took them off every year or two, but now I don't, unless there's an issue, I don't take them off. If they're keeping them clean and I can keep them clean, I leave them alone. You know, if I suspect that something's loose somewhere or I suspect there's a problem, then I'm taking them off. gets referred into me. Um, these are their Zimmer implants, but I can't put a bar through here. There's no space. And in her case, I've got to make an all acrylic denture. Although she got along very, very well with it, it wasn't ideal. And it wasn't ideal because it wasn't the treatment membrane. So there's the gas bar, and there's the denture. It has a Rebox attachments, a couple of rebox attachments in it, um, just because they're small and you don't take up a lot of space. Sitting around big above with a couple of snaps. I'm not sure you So was that screwed in, or were those like zest attachments? I'm sorry. I said, was that screwed in, or were those zest attachments in there? Well, they're like zest attachments. They're rebox. They have the same idea. They come into a metal. There's a little metal cup that gets s s bonded into the metal framework. Okay. And then the snap inside the denture snaps into it. Okay. But it pops off. It's not screwed in. Right. It pops off. It's not screwed in. <coughs> Paul, are, the, is that, are both components of that metal, the rebox? Yes. Uh, here, here's another one. 
This was the lady who was upset because she paid twenty some thousand dollars for for what she was hoping to be was fixed. And, and you can see the two middle implants. Um, they just went over the healing bodies. And of course, the problem with the locators is what they're like this. Divergent, yeah. So she's wearing this locator out all the time and complaining about having to have snaps all the time. So I took her existing denture and I took those metal, those metal temporary components that we had yesterday. Uh -huh. I put them through the denture, I cold cured them and I converted that and then ultimately I did uh, do some things and was able to make a very minimal metal framework in the middle of it to go from there. Here's what happens if you don't have a good anterior posterior spread, you break the screw. The solution to that was obviously new screws and shortening up the, uh, the cavity. And getting broken screws off, you talked about that? This afternoon. Okay. Uh, Explore it first, Cavitron. <coughs> I've never found, now, there are devices for stripped screws which are different than broken screws. Okay, so this is this is uh, Jesse in, in in June of '99, and um, we restore her. And um, I I didn't get involved um, before they took the bands off, and I, I need to just change that. This is really pixelated, but I've got a metal-based resin retained bridge here that's been in since '99. We've got an implant here and an implant here. And when she left in 99... Uh, by the way, the reason there's a resin bridge is there wasn't enough room for an implant there. We anticipated potentially doing it. There wasn't enough mesiofistal width. And so um, we could have redone her ortho, but we didn't. She didn't want to. So that's why she, we, we thought about it. We looked at it. But there wasn't enough space. So she has a reason. She's pretty smiling. She's happy. That's nice. Can't really tell. You can see some scar up there. That's that's a part of uh, from secondary to the repair uh, with the alveolar bone graft. Um, you can see some attached tissue on the labial aspect there. That was related to graft medicine. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I think the, uh, I know Paul wants to make a point about the length of the crown, but, but I thought we'd point those out. Yeah, please. And look at the you know papillae look good. I mean, this this had been there for a few years and still is there. Um, but she. Made it too short. 